a man accused of a crime he didn't commit becomes a tree. And then we travel to... That's not true, but we'll get to that. And then we travel to the Himalayas, where we explore an interesting story of a CIA agent on a quest. His mission... Retrieve the Yeti's arm today on Dead Rabbit Radio. Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of Dead Rabbit Radio. I'm your host, Jason Carpenter. I'm having a great day. I hope you guys are having a great day too. I hope you guys had a great weekend. We got a bunch of stuff to cover today, so we're going to jump right into it. First bit of news is my stomach's upset, so... Yay me, have to deal with that. Secondly, we got a new Patreon. We actually got a lot of Patreons over the weekend, but I'm going to do one per episode, spread you guys out. Our first Patreon of this week is Lori Snyder. So thank you. Thanks, Lori, for donating to the show. Really, really helps a lot. If you can't support the Patreon, that's fine. Just help get the word out about the show. Really, really helps out a lot as well. Leave us a review. We have merchandise as well, so all those things. Secondly, again, thank you, Lori. Secondly, this is not a bit. I'm warning you guys... That tomorrow's episode, the you know how I put up the different art, podcast art, you see it on the YouTube. Tomorrow's episode is going to contain what I believe is a haunted photograph. It's definitely a haunting photograph, but this photograph might actually be cursed. I wasn't going to do the story today, but because I was super creeped out when I looked at it, as I was getting ready to go to work this morning at like 6 in the morning, I was like looking at the, the photo is creepy so if you don't want to see a creepy photo there's it's just going to appear when you download the episode or you watch it on youtube it's just going to be this photo for a half hour (laughs) especially if you're watching on youtube there's no escape us podcast listeners you know you just look at our put put our phone in our pocket we're fine but i'm warning you guys if you don't want to see a cursed photo just skip tomorrow's episode. However, tomorrow's episode is pretty good. So so it's either, do you want to be cursed? Or do you want to hear a good episode of Dead Rabbit Radio? It's up to you. But I wanted to give you guys that warning. Now, this episode is also good. You don't have to skip this one and go to sleep waiting for tomorrow to come closer. Let's go ahead and get started here with our first story. We are headed off to Mobile, Alabama. So Lori, you take control of the Carpenter Copter. We're boarding on it. Get on, get on before the creepy photo. Creepy photos following us. We're like, no, no, hurry. We're leaving some people behind. Nah, nah. We take off. We're flying away as we see some listeners struggling with the two dimensional. It's creepy, man. I shouldn't be making fun of it because it's actually quite tragic. <laughs> Anyways, we're flying away from the photograph. We're flying away from those we left behind. We salute you. We're headed to Mobile, Mobile, Alabama. I don't know why they pronounce it like that, but they do. Mobile, Alabama. The year is 1834. We're going to land the Carpenter Copter Town Square and set on invisibility mode. Now we're walking through the old-timey streets of Mobile, Alabama. We're in magical 1834 clothes. So, like, what is that? Like, wraps, basically cloth sewn together. So, I don't even know what they wore back then. But anyways, we're walking around in this clothes. It's all wool. It's all itchy. We're walking around. And I guess everything was made of cotton in the South. (laughs) Anyways, that's not the point. So that's the point. We're walking through Mobile, Alabama, and we see a dude walking down the street. Now, we're seeing tons of dudes walking down the street, but we see one in particular. His name is Charles R.S. Boynton. He's a known gambler. That's kind of what he's known for. He's a gambler, right? And he's walking with this other dude, his friend, acquaintance, maybe? Uh, Nathaniel Frost is this dude. And they're walking down the street together, and everyone sees this. It's a slow day. Obviously, everyone's paying attention to Chuck and Nathaniel. Later, however, Nathaniel is found stabbed to death by a cemetery, which, to be fair, is convenient. It's very, very polite of the killer to stab you at a cemetery. Stabs him to death, and he was robbed. So people go, okay, let's look at this. Nathaniel owed Charles money, because they're both gamblers, and they play some bad bets. Nathaniel owns Charles' money. Charles and Nathaniel are seen on this day, May 11th, walking down the street. Nathaniel ends up dead and robbed. Charles probably did it. So Charles is arrested. He goes to trial and he's found guilty. None of that should be shocking to anybody. He's found guilty. And he goes, this is a quote. I'm in it. I love this. Uh, this. Okay, here's the thing. Okay, let me read this quote to you and then we'll kind of go into it. <laughs> he stands up. Charles stands up and goes, I'm innocent. 
and as proof, a mighty oak tree will pop out of my grave. You should probably want to show evidence (laughs) before you're executed. Like, if you have the ability to have a magical curse, you might want it to be, I'm innocent, and as proof, a tree will appear in my hand right now. Bing! A little little palm tree in his hand. Everyone's like, ah. But anyways, he doesn't really think ahead. This guy apparently has the ability to to spring a life. He's spontaneous creation of life. But anyways, he is executed. And then they bury him. But then an oak tree appears out of his grave. And, and that tree exists today. It's called the Boynton Oak. Very, very famous. Okay, let me, let me put that in air quotes. It's famous for ghost hunters in Mobile, Alabama. That you can go and you can visit this tree. It's a paranormal event. It's the man who said, If I'm innocent, may an oak tree pop out of my grave. So, did he act... Was he innocent? Now it's a true crime story. No, he most likely was not innocent. Yes, circumstantial evidence and all, but there was no, as far as I know, no other suspects. I don't know if there were any, like, if he had any leads, if he was like, no, no, give me 48 hours and I'll, I'll use my oak powers. I'll use the power of the trees to find the real murderer. He's talking to acorns. That didn't happen. He was probably the guy who murdered him. And here's the thing, though. Here's the, Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I'm... Maybe I'm going to wake up, there's a bunch of ghosts, ghosts of squirrels floating around me. Why'd you mess with Charles? He's the king of the forest. The, this is actually, the reason why I wanted to cover this story, one, because it is this weird paranormal story that gets passed around a lot, and there's physical proof of it. Charles Boynton is a real historical person. There is a real tree on his grave. I think that, this, and this is hilarious. If, if my theory is true, this might be the greatest scam ever perpetrated, ever. I get arrested for murdering Nathaniel Frost, right? I'm sitting in jail, and I want to have my... I I did it. I totally did it, but I want to have my name cleared. What what I... Now, now, some of you guys out there may go, Jason, this is impossible, but I don't think so. I don't think so. So, (laughs) what I would do is I would get an acorn, and I'd swallow it, right? Before I died. Now, you would... I don't think... You would have to time it right. Because if you swallowed it like a couple days before, your stomach acid would. And to do this segment, I had to do a bunch of research on whether or not you can eat acorns. You can. If you eat two, they actually have this thing. This just sounds hellish. They contain a thing called anti-nutrients that actually suck nutrients out of you. That's so bizarre that that would even exist on the planet. But anyways, you have to cook acorns to get rid of the anti-nutrients. But you can eat a raw acorn. You're just not supposed to eat a bunch of them. If you swallow the acorn, like, say, a week before execution, you're just going to digest it, right? What I imagine this guy did was he's being led up to the gallows, and he's in a sweaty hand, in a closed fist, he has an acorn. He's holding it, and he's hiding it from everyone, and they all know his famous curse, that a giant tree, again, which is kind of a mild curse. Oh, yes, place we can put a tire swing. You've, you've ruined the city, Charles. Damn you. He's walking up to the gallows holding an acorn in his hand. And they go, any last words? And he's like, hmm. And he like raises his hand to his mouth. And he goes, <coughs> like fakes a cough. And then gulp, swallows the acorn right there. And he's like, um, yeah, yeah, the tree thing. I'm just, my last words is I'm going to say the tree thing again. And everyone's like, oh, that's pretty succinct. And then they hang him. And then by that time, they would, is, I don't, does your stomach acid go away when you die? Yeah, what happens to your stomach acid when you die? Does it just, like, sit there? If you dug up... This is getting grim. If you dug up someone who'd been dead for, say, a month and took his stomach out, would it be full of stomach acid? Or does it just kind of dissolve away? Does it kind of just... Like, <laughs> is it like soda when you pour it and it fizzes? I know nothing about human biology or science in general, but here's my here's my theory. Maybe he swallowed it. And it didn't fall in his stomach acid. I don't know. The point is, is that he swallowed an acorn. This is my theory. I have no idea if it's scientifically sound. He swallows an acorn and they put him in the dirt. They put him in a grave. And um, now I'm realizing that the dirt (laughs) needs to get into the grave. Maybe he paid them extra to drill a hole into the... I don't know. The point is, is that a, a tree grew out. But I think he swallowed an acorn and then it came out of him. That makes more sense. <laughs> You're like, no, it doesn't, Jason. That makes less sense than a ghost 
curse like a paranormal witch magically making a tree appear. Your scenario of a man as he's being hung, swallowing an acorn, paying a gravedigger to dig a hole, like drill a hole into his wooden casket. So sand as they're burying him. Sand will fall into his... Did did he pay someone to come and water him every day, too? I don't know. He did have money. He robbed that dude. Maybe he had gravedigger money. Maybe he could afford to to pay off a gravedigger. So, that's my theory. I think the guy really existed. I think the tree's real. The question is, was it a paranormal event, or did a man simply, through a series of comically bizarre events... Managed to swallow an acorn. It would have been awfully embarrassing if he goes, a mighty oak will appear from my grave, and then like an elm showed up, or a weeping willow. People would be like, eh, that's kind of that's kind of a curse. But eh, he's probably guilty. Everyone just leaves that paranormal tree alone. Let's go ahead and move on to our next story. Now, for our next story, we are headed to the Himalayas. So put your parkas on, get those little snow boots. And also, I wanted to give uh, a shout out to a listener who actually requested the story, Ennio. Ennio, thank you so much for requesting the story. I was actually working on it at the time, but because of his request, I actually moved it up in the production schedule. So thank you so much for the story idea as well. So we're headed off to the Himalayas. The year is 1957. And we're not taking the Carpenter Copter this time. We're going to leave it back in Mobile, Alabama. We're hitching a ride. We are hitching a ride with adventurer Tom Slick. Texas man, he's an oil baron. He was really good friends with Prescott Bush. That's George Bush's pops. Uh, George Bush Jr.'s grandpa. Really, really influential dude in the Texas scene. He made tons of money slanging that black oil, that Texas tea, right? So here's the interesting thing, though. He was this rich dude. He had all these powerful connections. But his hobby was hunting monsters, which I think is what a lot of us would do. If I won the lottery, I would probably just travel America and maybe even the world and do this show on the road, doing it at hotel rooms and stuff like that. Going to the small towns, going up to Boynton Oak, taking a piss, swallowing an acorn at the scene of the crime. And then the next episode, I'm in the hospital. I'm like, hey, guys, I'm full of anti-nutrients. That's what he did. And this we're, we're in the 1950s here, too. So he's looking at, like, the Loch Ness Monster. He's chasing down the Yeti. And he's... I never heard of this before. In Northern California, he's after this thing called the Trinity Alps Giant Salamander. I was like, oh, that's cool. What is that? It's just a giant salamander. It actually... It's almost like... If I found that, I'd be disappointed. I'd, if you're looking for the Loch Ness, you're looking for a Bigfoot, can't find those, you find a giant salamander, and you're like, yes! Oh, wait, no, this kind of sucks. It's just a big old snake. Not a snake. It's a big old salamander. Doesn't have no magical powers. But in 1957, Tom Slick was up in the Himalayas looking for the Yeti. And he runs into this monk. He doesn't, like, randomly bump into him in the Himalayas. He's, like, at a monastery. The monk's like, hey, so you're looking for monsters. You believe in the Yeti, right? And Tom's like, I do, sir. Do you have any, like, information on any of this stuff? And the monastery guy, the monk, is what they're normally referred to. He goes, yes. Let's flashback. Years ago, in Pangbochi, Nepal. Except the monk knows how to pronounce that correctly. There's a Buddhist monastery, right? And in this monastery, there are rumors. The flashback even farther. One day a monk, a young monk, was walking through the Himalayas looking for a place to meditate. And he sees a cave. And he walks into this ice cave. Storm roiling outside the cave. The monk walks in. And he sees in the cave, he's like, oh, this is a perfect place to meditate. I'm no longer freezing to death. I can finally concentrate on filling my mind with nothingness. And then he looks... And deep in the cave is a massive yeti sitting in the cave. And the monk's like, oh, and he runs out of the cave. He might have walked out calmly. He is a monk after all. But he leaves the cave. And then years later, he comes back to the cave. (laughs) Braves the storm, walks into the cave. Yeti is dead. And the monk goes, hmm. Interesting. So he cuts off the Yeti's arm and the top of his head. Okay, don't stop me. Let me keep going here. I know you guys already have some questions. Cuts off the Yeti's arm and the top of his head. Brings him back. And in this monastery in Pangboch, Nepal, 
you can see the skull cap and the arm of the fabled Yeti. Ding-ling-ling! So the, the flashback ends, and Tom Slick's sitting there, and he's like, that is fascinating. I have to see this arm. And the monk goes, you can see the arm, but can't take it with you. That's stealing. It's like, belongs to the monks. And Tom Slick's like, yeah, no stealing, as his eyes shift from side to side. Now, let, let me address this, because I have a bad tendency of forgetting stuff as I go forward. Is this story is the story true? Let me address this part of it real quick because I didn't write this down in my notes. Just as I was thinking of, just as I was telling the story, I thought of this: a guy walks into a cave, sees a yeti, and leaves, and then comes back a couple years later. Like, what was he doing in the meantime? That's quibbling, though. He's just really good at meditating, and one day he's meditating. He's like, "Oh, I, I forgot. I ran into a mythical creature." He goes back a couple years later. He walks into a cave. There is a Yeti there. Now, it's dead. He can do whatever he wants to the body. What is the one... Okay, so you have a dead Yeti, right? And you, you're you going to take some body parts from it. Because you can't move the whole thing. It's up in the mountains. What are you going to do? What's the one thing that Yeti is known for? In America, is he known as Big Hand? Like, why the arm and the skull cap? Why not the foot... And the head, the whole head, right? So that makes it a little suspicious to begin with, right? If you stumbled across a Bigfoot body in the middle of the woods, you're like, oh, yes, proof. First off, let me take off one of his eyebrows and two fingers. No, you take his feet, because that's what he's known for. But anyways, that being said, that little bit of information, I actually am less skeptical of this story than a lot of stuff we've covered. And we'll get into that in a second here. So I'm not super like, oh, this story's fake. Because there is, Tom Slick was real, this expedition was real, this is all historical. The question is, what was in that monastery? So let's go back to the narrative here. In 1959, Tom Slick, he sponsors another expedition to go to that particular monastery in Pengbochi, Nepal. Now, I don't know if he went with them or if he just sponsored it. He might have been busy doing, making some moves in Texas, selling some oil. He's out at a gas station, <laughs> pumping gas. He actually has a very storied past. We'll get into that in a second as well. But anyways, 1959, he sends some dudes out to that monastery. And there's this guy named Peter Byrne. And they're like, take photos of the hand. And if you can, bring it back. There was a retrieval mission. This was not a tourist expedition. He goes out there. Peter Byrne goes out there, meets the monks. Hey, guys, what's up? Doing the doing the monk, secret monk handshake. They walk in and there, there are photographs of this arm and this skull cap supposedly belonging to the Yeti. Now, Peter Byrne's taking pictures of it. They got this evidence. And Peter Byrne goes, hey, guys, the photos are cool and all, but can we take the hand? Monks are like, no. And they're like, no, you know, let me finish. We just want to take the hand and we'll bring it back. No, 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 no. We can do scientific experiments on it. No, no, no. You're not taking the hand. And then Peter Byrne goes, hey, look, over there. Um, it's eternal bliss and enlightenment. And all the monks turned around and he broke a finger off of the hand and then replaced it with a human finger, and then wrapped it up in, like, a mummy bandage, and left. Now, to be fair, that's pretty slimy, stealing, you know, like this... I wouldn't say it's a, a holy relic, but it was... It, it's like breaking into a church and stealing something. However, if you can't... There's a couple questions with this one, too. One, the hand itself is like this monster's hand, and he's replaced a finger bone with a human finger bone, right? And then you'd be like, well, that's suspicious. That finger is oddly small, and we've had this thing for years. Secondly, he wraps it up, but did he, like, have to age bandages and stuff like that to get it to look right? But thirdly, where did he get the human finger bone from? Who lost that bet? On the way up to Nepal, they're like, hey, by the way, in, in case we pull this off, we need one of your finger bones. Did he have it with him? Was he? I'm assuming he didn't break off like, like the guy standing next to him. As the monks are busy, he turns to his buddy and just goes, hey, look over there. It's uh, eternal bliss and enlightenment. The guy's like, what? I'm not even a monk. And he turns to look, chops his finger off. Like he must have had the finger ready to go. Anyways, he takes the finger and then... To make this whole thing weirder, he can't, he can't get it out of the country because I think at this point people are like, hey, look at the, someone stolen part of this hand. He has to give it to the actor Jimmy Stewart. The dude from It's a Wonderful Life is in on this as well. How this hasn't been made into a movie, I, I have no idea. It's Tom Hanks. Every character's played by Tom Hanks. Jimmy Stewart takes the finger. This is all real. This is all historical. Takes this Yeti finger and is able to get it through customs. 
Because who's going to search a celebrity's stuff, right? That's how. That's why a lot of rappers get wrapped up in drug smuggling. That, that's what happened to Juice World. Who's moving? I don't know if he was smuggling drugs for someone else or if he was just that was his personal supply. But they usually don't check celebrities. So they've recently been cracking down on on rappers. But that, a lot of celebrities traffic uh, drugs. That's very, very. That's, that's an open secret in Hollywood because they don't get stopped at customs. The so, anyways, Jimmy Stewart does get the. Finger back to the United States. Now, that story was pretty much unknown until the 1980s. Someone was writing a biography on Tom Slick. Tom Slick was a very well-known Texas businessman with this bizarre hobby of hunting cryptids. Now, what happened was the photos get published. Not everyone knows this finger's floating around in America, but the photos get published and it becomes a big thing. In the 1960s, there's this thing being written called the World Book. And they're putting on this big exhibition for, hey, we're writing the world book and we're sending people all over the world to get interesting facts about the world. And in the Himalayas, you have Sir Edmund Hillary, who's the famous mountain climber guy, and Marlon Perkins. I have no idea who that is. Anyways, they're in the Himalayas and um, they're like, hey, you know, let's stop by and see that, that monster hand that we read about on the news. And they walk into the monastery and they're looking at the hand and nobody knew about the switcheroo. The, the monks, I think, picked up on it because that's why that guy couldn't smuggle it out. But I don't think they were letting people know. And maybe they didn't. Maybe Peter Byrne just had a bunch of other priors and he knew they were going to go through his luggage. Maybe nobody knew that the finger had been swapped at this time. But anyways, when Hillary and Perkins go to the monastery, the, uh, Hillary laughed at it. He goes, this is obviously a human's arm. This is a total fake. Someone's been conned by this. This is completely ridiculous. Completely ridiculous. It's a piece of garbage. So that's happening in 1960. At the same time, Peter Byrne brings the finger bone. He gets it back from Jimmy Stewart. He brings the finger bone to some scientists and says, hey guys, check this out. And they look at it and they go, it's not human. And he's like, yes, this is so awesome. They go, it's not human. It's humanoid. Whatever this belonged to. Possibly Neanderthal. So, not conclusive that it's Yeti, but it does place it out. It's not a human bone. And and people have looked back on this and said that Hillary was declaring this a hoax, but he didn't know he was looking at a modified arm. So he might have just been focused on the pinky and go, what? That's a human pinky. The rest of the hand he didn't really look at. But anyways, that's most likely not true. He probably looked at the whole thing and goes, it's a total hoax. They said it's not human. Humanoid. Neanderthal, most likely. So not necessarily Yeti, but still something worth writing home about. Because the story is a guy walks in, and imagine if it wasn't a Yeti, but a guy walks in an ice cave, and there's a Neanderthal sitting in the cave. Leaves, comes back years later, he's dead. 1962, here's a detail I left out for dramatic effect. And this is going to recolor the whole story I just told you. And this is what you, right now we're just at a Bigfoot story. Now things get weird. 1962, Tom Slick dies in a plane accident. The plane just dissolves in midair, just completely falls apart. And you're like, okay, that's tragic. He's an adventurer, though, and planes do blow up. They don't always fall apart, but they do have... Ac- he worked for the CIA. So did Sir Edmund Hillary. So did Marlon Perkins. The 1960 World Book Exhibition, they were there to walk the Himalayas and to spy on China rocket tests. They were working under the guise of the World Book Tour. These goodwill ambassadors traveling the world, all over the world, were really gathering information on enemy governments, things like that. Tom Slick, his entire, and some of you guys probably clued in this in the beginning, Prescott Bush, very tied into the intelligence organizations. George Bush famously led the CIA. Tom Slick worked with the CIA. His traveling around the world, hunting monsters, was something he loved to do. It was also a cover for his intelligence gathering missions. So I guess I kind of gave it away in the intro a bit with the CIA hunting Bigfoot, but this whole, all of this stuff, these are all CIA, if not run by CIA operatives, done with the blessing of the CIA. And what his plane disintegrating in air is suspicious. It does happen, but it's rare. How often do you hear about a car driving down the road and they're like, it just disintegrated. Like, everything fell apart and the guy was eventually just rolling on the ground by himself and another car hit him. Planes do crash and stuff like that, but generally there is a reason for it. I Am, am I insinuating that somebody took him out for his work as a spook? I am. 
Was it because that he <laughs> uncovered the Yeti's arm? No, I don't know. Probably not. He probably didn't. He probably wasn't flying back to Washington with photos of Loch Ness Monster and they're like, take him out. And they blow his plane up. But he, he, when you're involved with intelligence agencies, there's a chance, there is a higher likelihood that your plane is going to disintegrate than if you're just the monster hunter. Unless, of course, like Mothman's chasing you. This whole story pretty much just kind of dies down. You had Sir Edmund Hillary goes, it's fake. This, this hand's not real. You had the whole Jimmy Stewart finger being broken off and all that's not Jimmy Stewart's finger being broken off. He's like, oh, it's not a wonderful life. My hand. That whole story wasn't uncovered until the 1980s when someone was uh, found all these letters detailing it when they were working on a biography of Tom Slick. The hand was just in this monastery. They're like, no, 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 it's real. But in the West, they're like, it's a fraud. 1991. Unsolved Mysteries does a segment on this hand. It's known as the Pengbochi hand. So you have this hand and you have this skull cap. And in 1991, Unsolved Mysteries does an episode on it, right? And they're able to track down an American anthropologist who, his name is George Agognio. Agognio? And he has the pieces. He has the pieces and he runs a test on them again. And on the episode of Unsolved Mysteries, he says, with more modern technology, it's not human. It's near human. But it's not human. So it's the same results, 20 years apart, 30 years apart, same results. After the Unsolved Mysteries episode airs, the arm and the skullcap are stolen from the monastery. They have never been seen again. The theory is that they've disappeared into, like, a private collection. But after that episode aired in 1991, someone broke into the monastery, it's gone. Nothing's there. The last piece of news we have is in 2011... Someone else has tested the finger bone, and they came to the conclusion, it's human. Here's this quote. We've got a very, very strong match to a number of existing reference sequences on human DNA databases. Human is what we were expecting, and human is what we got. I added that last part just for the sake of clarification, because I don't want to leave information out that goes against my point. I don't think it was a human arm. I don't think it was a human arm for a couple different reasons. I think it's possible that what this last lab tested was human, that if someone was able to break into a monastery, and not like they have the best security forces in the world, well, they're all martial artists, but if someone goes through the trouble of stealing a hand and a skull cap, I think they can replace a bone in a laboratory from this George Agonia, Gogonia, whatever his name is. You can break into his house and replace the bone fragment with a human bone. Jimmy Stewart's like, no, not my other finger. And then, when they, if they ever tested it later, it would come back as human, but the hand gets stolen, it disappears. If it, This is my biggest thing about why I think this story is true. Why I think this story is true. It, it getting stolen after the Unsolved Mysteries thing is a pretty bizarre indicator that somebody with access to, you know, like being able to go to Nepal and break into monasteries wanted this hand and this skullcap. Whenever we look at stories, when I'm debunking stuff, the question always is, what is in it for the people perpetrating the story? A lot of times, ghost stories are about attention or something. You know, you infield haunting or Amityville, all these things we can find financial or psychological reasons for faking these things, i.e. fame or Amityville. They wanted to sell, they wanted to get out of their lease or whatever it was. So a lot of times we can find Reasons why people were like, why would a group of monks in the middle of nowhere set up an arm and a skull cap? Again, if they were going to fake it, why not take the foot and the head? Because you're just faking the whole thing anyways. You Maybe it's easier to fake a hand. I don't know. But anyways, you have the arm and the skull cap in a monastery. Tom Slick found out about this monastery randomly. It wasn't like they were putting out flyers downtown. Come see the Yeti arm. Come on and check it out. Texas billionaires get half off ticket price. It was a random thing that he showed up to, and they weren't charging money for it. It was just something they're like, yeah, um, this monk, Joe, he found it one day. Isn't that weird looking here? Look at all of our other stuff. And then, you know, I don't know, try being a Buddhist. Try enlightening yourself. Eh, And I'm just going to stay here and stare at this arm. What was the... If it was a fraud... If this arm was in downtown Mobile, Alabama, this whole story took place in a very accessible spot, I'd be like, yeah, it's probably a fraud. This guy was selling tickets. But the fact that it's a monastery in Nepal, and they're like, no, we're not letting you take a picture of it. We're not letting you take it with you. We're keeping it here. 
makes me think that whatever he... Th- this is the most likely scenario of events. A guy walks into a cave, sees a frozen Neanderthal, and thinks it's alive, leaves, come back years later, the ice is thawed, the body's now laying down. Again, not a big scientist. <laughs> he would rot. But it, my point is, is that... That, to me, that it's probably Neanderthal arm. At the very least, I don't think it's human. I don't think it's human. I think that would make more sense. And when you walked in, you see a guy frozen, standing up. Oh, leave. Come back later. The f- it's all melted. He's laying on the ground. He's rotted away. See a bit of a skeleton chop off his hand and his head. That makes more sense to me. But whatever the case is, these people in the story, they're historically true. The hand, whether or not it's real... It did exist, and now someone has it in their private collection. An arm from a long-dead species or subspecies of human? Possibly. The arm of a mythological creature. Proof, finally, that the Yeti exists. Maybe. But whatever the case, it's now in the hands of a private collector. Or, most likely, the government. It's possible that the government of Nepal took it for safekeeping. But are they really watching Unsolved Mysteries? It's more likely that at CIA headquarters, some guy is watching Unsolved Mysteries. He's supposed to be watching security cameras. Storm Shadow sneaking in the facility, killing people. He's like, I'm not paying attention to that. He instead is watching Unsolved Mysteries, and he's watching this whole story, and he's like... Oh, dude, we totally forgot about that arm. Out of all those millions of dollars we put in researching that, we totally forgot about that. So you make a couple phone calls. You have some CIA agents. You you bring Jimmy Stewart out of retirement or back from the grave. He might have been dead in 1991. You send them into Nepal. You retrieve this relic. And somewhere in an undisclosed location, there is a warehouse. It looks abandoned, maybe a little creepy. But it's just out there in the middle of Kansas. And if you walk into the warehouse, there's nothing there. Looks like an empty lot. But if you know the combination, if you know the right set of girders to walk by before you hang left, and then look slightly 90 degrees up at the security camera, barely visible, you will get buzzed in to a facility full of relics of items, of things that, while not important to national security, you don't want anyone else to have. A museum of the bizarre, of the weird, of the dangerous. Because as technology advances, if you have a bone of a yeti, Imagine an army infused with the DNA of a creature that time forgot. Is that bizarre to think that you could have a cloned army of yetis? Absolutely. But part of working for the Central Intelligence Agency is thinking 50 years ahead. You have to plan for the bizarre to maintain a normal American life. DeadRabbitRadio at gmail.com is going to be our email address. You can also hit us up at facebook.com slash deadrabbitradio. Twitter is at deadrabbitradio. Dead Rabbit Radio is the daily paranormal conspiracy and true crime podcast. You don't have to listen to it every day, but I'm glad you listened to it today. Have a great one, guys. Peace.